Ladies and gentlemen, let us have a round of applause for our chief guest, Dr. Sanjeev Sanya, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of GeoSec, Gujarat University Startup and Entrepreneurship Council at this very special session of lecture by Dr. Sanjeev Sanyal, Honorable Principal Economic Advisor to the Government of India. Gujarat University Startup and Entrepreneurship Council, widely known as GeoSec, has been a leading institution in the country undertaking efforts to support student ideas, startups and innovations. As a part of its different activities, GeoSec has come up again with a very special lecture session on a very special topic regarding history of our great country, India. Let us begin this program with University Song. Please rise for Gujarat University Song. With this, we would like to invite on stage our very special guest for today, Honorable Dr. Sanjeev Sanya sir. He will be accompanied by Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor sir, Gujarat University, Dr. Jagdish Bhausa sir. I would request Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor sir to welcome Dr. Sanjeev Sanya sir with flowers, memento. Sir, please take your seat. It is our honor to have the esteemed presence of Honorable Dr. Sanjeev Sanyal, who is Principal Economic Advisor to the Government of India. An internationally acclaimed economist, economist and best-selling author, he spent two decades in the financial sector and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank till 2015. He was named Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum in 2010. He is also a well-known environmentalist and urban theorist. In 2007, he was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship for his work on urban dynamics. He has been a visiting scholar at Oxford University, adjunct fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, Singapore, and a senior fellow of the World Wide Fund for Nature. He has also served on the Future City Subcommittee of the Singapore Government, tasked with building a long-term vision for the city state. <laughs> 
Dr. Sanjeev Sanyal attended Sri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi and Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar. His best selling books in include Land of the Seven Rivers, The Indian Renaissance and The Ocean of Churn, all published by Penguin. In addition, he had published around 200 articles, columns and reports in leading national and international publications. He was given the inaugural International Indian Achievers Award for contributions to literature in 2014. He has been a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society London and a visiting fellow of IDFC Institute Mumbai. And now the moment has come for all of us to witness a special lecture, The Revolutionaries, a retelling of India's history by the distinguished speaker who is known for his positive and motivational attitude towards international issues, his dynamic range of acquaintances, and his image of globally renowned youth leader. I would like to call upon Dr. Sanjeev Sanya sir to deliver the lecture. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome him with a round of applause, Honorable Dr. Sanjeev Sanya sir. Good morning, everyone. So let me begin first by thanking uh, Pro Chancellor Avsarji, the staff and faculty, alumni, and of course the current students of Gujarat University. It's a, indeed a pleasure to be here. And uh, I must admit, I did not expect uh, such a large hall and that it would be basically completely full. So uh, thank you very much. Now, the purpose of this lecture uh, is a topic that is very dear to my heart, but it is, uh, we can probably keep the lights a little dim over in front so that the presentation is uh, more visible. Can somebody switch off the lights right in front? It might be more uh, visible. So, yeah, thank you. Now, the lecture that I will give is a lecture about India's freedom struggle and telling it from a somewhat different perspective. Uh, it is not a lecture on economics, although I am the principal economic advisor to the government and uh, last few weeks I've been giving a lot of lectures on economics. Uh, in fact, yesterday as well, I gave a lecture on uh, uh, India uh, and its economic policies uh, at um, uh, Ahmedabad University. But today I'm going to talk about another issue which is very dear to my heart which is this, that I have argued for many years <clears throat> that India's history needs to be rewritten and retold. And I'm going to illustrate this point using the story of India's freedom struggle. Now, the usual way in which the story of India's freedom struggle is told, you get the impression that it was a uniquely nonviolent movement. So you get the impression that basically we gently suggested to the British that they should leave and they politely left. But there is actually also another history, a history of armed resistance, which was sustained over several decades. This history, unfortunately, has been almost edited out of our history books and of the national narrative. Now, it is not that we have entirely forgotten the characters who participated in this story. The names such as Chandrasekhar Azad, Sri Aurobindo, Rash Bihari Bose, uh, Bhagat Singh, etc. are still household names. But you get the impression that these were random acts of individual bravery and resistance perhaps but it didn't really add up to any real broader narrative. As a result of which you get the impression that these were mostly isolated acts of bravery, which didn't really contribute to India's independence. So what I'm going to try and show you here today is that in fact, 
this resistance of these revolutionaries was a part of a concerted, well-organized um, effort to rid India of British colonial rule, that it involved many people repeating themselves through the story, i.e. there is a clear continuity of thought, a continuity of leadership over long periods of time, and that this story then has a completely different narrative of how India became free. Now let me clarify, I'm not making the case that the nonviolent movement did not have a role. It did. But I'm just saying that there is another story, and that story too needs to be told. So let me begin at the, in the turn of the last century, from the 19th to the 20th century. Now remember, at this time, by this time, India had been under British rule for several decades. The last true resistance to the British had been the revolt of 1857. And that, of course, had been brutally put down. And although you did have some occasional glimmerings of resistance, like, for example, with the tribals under Birsa Munda, or you had the Manipuri aristocracy putting up a resistance in, I think, the around about 1890. Yes, many people forget that even the Northeast had uh, a lot of resistance to British rule. These uh, acts of resistance basically never really threatened British rule. So by the end of the 19th century, India was very much under colonial control. And although the Indian National Congress had been set up, it was, at least in the beginning, basically a debating society. In fact, the British encouraged the the establishment and development of the, uh, in, in, of the Indian uh, National Congress because they looked on it as a reliable safety valve which didn't really threaten their rule. This began to change, however, by the end of the century. One, ideologically, because of the emergence of thinkers like Vivekananda, for example, but also in the political sphere because of the rise of leaders, which later came to be known as the Garam Dal. Leaders, the trio, Lal, Bal, Pal, who we will know. And so there began to be a much more aggressive demand for self-rule that began to emerge from that period. Now this is the milieu in which the very first act in this story happened in Pune. When the Sapekar brothers <coughs> killed a um, uh, W.C. Rand, who was a plague inspector and a very draconian one at that, on Ganesh Khind Road in Pune. This is a photograph in the middle of what Ganesh Khind Road looked at that point in time. And this is one of the brothers on the left. And they shot dead W.C. Rand. They were, however, betrayed very quickly by members of their own community and they were all hanged. There is still a Memorial to them on Ganeshkin Road, although it doesn't look like this anymore. It's across from a popular mall. Uh, many people who go to that mall never look across the road and see this very small uh, memorial. Uh, and many of most Punekars will be completely ignorant of the existence of this uh, site. But it's still there. So if you go to Pune and go to Ganeshkin Road, please look it up. Now, this particular act of revolt was, however, Basically, not a part of any grander plan. It was just an isolated incident, but it did trigger many new ideas across India. And you begin to see that pop up in Bengal with the formation of the Anushilan Samiti in 1902. Now, when this Anushilan Samiti was set up in 1902, it was basically a local youth sports club and it was set up in a place in North Kolkata in Ishwar Thakur Ro uh, Lane. The place where this happened in uh, North Kolkata is still in existence. You can visit it. It's still a local youth club. You can see it's a very narrow entrance and if you go inside there, earlier of course they used to teach uh, wrestling and those kinds of things. But today mostly uh, when I visited it, uh, I found uh, it's basically a badminton club. 
And there is nothing there which will tell you that the Anishinaan Samiti had been set up there, except for this map at the back, <coughs> which seems to be left behind of undivided India. So what were these youth clubs doing? Basically, these were small local youth club, and they began to organize themselves in various ways and began to distribute subversive literature. So it started in Kolkata, but then groups like this began to pop up in Dhaka, Borisal, and other places in Bengal, and even outside Bengal. So in Maharashtra, for example, you began to see Abhinav Bharat and other groups begin to pop up. So these were small cells. In the beginning, they were not doing anything particular other than just uh, spreading ideas. Till these two gentlemen turned up in the scene. Aurobindo Ghosh and his brother Barin Ghosh. Now, many of you may have heard of Sri Aurobindo, the spiritual leader. His actual name is, full name is Aurobindo Ghosh, and he was the, one of the founders of the revolutionary movement. Many people don't know this. And he returned from uh, Britain after, complete, uh, after completing his education. He had been sent there by his father <coughs> to study, uh, to uh, stand for the civil service and become an ICS officer. But although he took his exams and did very well, he refused to take his horse riding test. And he decided to come back to India. And he came, in fact, to uh, Gujarat, to Baroda where he worked as the personal secretary of the Gaikwad king, who, by the way, has a, himself a very interesting and distinguished uh, history of supporting nationalist movements. So he came here, and while he was here, he was very inspired by um, Anandamad, and this idea that you could create a, a group of uh, warrior monks to take on foreign rule. So he began to look for various places to start this, and he was trying to identify a, a um, Bhavani temple somewhere in the Gujarat Maharashtra area. But while he was doing this, his own brother began to connect through in Bengal with all these Anushalan Samiti uh, groups. And they began to actually do much more radical things than before. One of them was to set up a uh, ammunition and bomb factory just north of Kolkata in a place called Maniktala in a Baganbadi, which is a garden house. Now, where ex I went looking for where exactly this place was and I had great difficulty. I went to Maniktala and I, uh, in the place where I think this uh, uh, garden house was, uh, I went to that neighborhood, but nobody seemed to know exactly where it was. There is, however, a field, the open field there, which is still called Bomamat, which is bomb field which perhaps has some memory left locally of that. But this is where, um, in this general area, they began to um, create a group. Unfortunately, the British got wind of this. And there were a few acts of uh, 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 revolutionary uh, shootings and so on. And so the British began to keep track of them. And ultimately, in 1908, they were raided. And uh, both Barin Ghosh and Aurobindo Ghosh were um, uh, arrested. Uh, many of their other connect, uh, uh, contacts were also arrested and they were taken to Alipur jail, which is why this was called the Alipur bomb case. Um, Barin Ghosh would eventually be sent off to the cellular jail in the Andamans. But Aurobindo would uh, be left uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to go out on bail for a little while and he would escape to Pondicherry, where he would spend the rest of his life. He would eventually move away from this movement and become more into the spiritual direction, but he had already lit the fire. Now, while all of this was going on in India, there were a group of Indian students in London, and they were organized around a student accommodation hostel set up by Shamji Krishna Varma in London called India House. And a lot of young students began to come and live there and they began to, began to follow a very dynamic young man called Savarkar, Vinayak Savarkar, later to be known as Veer Savarkar. And Savarkar was an extraordinary man because not only did he have these new ideas and he was a good organizer, 
he also began to write all kinds of new writings and literature, which would end up being very, very important because he effectively created the underlying strategy of the revolutionaries. So all this while the revolutionaries were disparate groups, maybe radicalized, but no real overall strategy. But while he was there, Savarkar wrote a book on the revolt of 1857. And in that book, he made the case <coughs> that the way to free India was to cause a revolt in the military services, the Indian army, the Indian soldiers who were loyal to the British. And he said that, look, in 1857, you had this, and that was just a, um, you can call it a, uh, uh, a trial run, and that ultimately, if the revolutionaries want to succeed, they've got to undermine the loyalty of the Indian soldier to the British crown. And this is important, I'm going to repeat this, because this is going to pop up more and more through the story. Because even though Savarkar himself would drift away from the revolutionary movement as well, this general strategy would remain in place, as you will see, throughout the rest of this movement. Now, while they were there, what was going on, that the British again came to understand that this group was operating out of India House, and they began to keep track of this place. Now, the students themselves were very aware that they were being kept track of. But they would, what they would do is they would, they knew very clearly there were all these Scotland Yard undercover policemen standing outside, and they would deliberately go and mock them. So they go up to them and ask them to light their cigarette or ask them for directions. So just to make fun of them and just let them know that we know that you're keeping track of us. Now, one of Savakar's followers, Madanla Lingra, however, decided that the amount of surveillance was going out of hand. And he decided to assassinate Curzon Wiley, who was in charge of this uh, uh, Scotland Yard unit that was keeping track of the in, uh, India House students. And in July 1909, Madan Lal Dhigra assassinated Curzon Wiley at the Imperial College, uh, Imperial Institute. The place where he did this, by the way, is um, uh, that particular building is no longer there, but that venue is still a part of Imperial College. Only one building is left of that, is that bell tower. And I visited it last year. And so, of course, as soon as he carried, assassinated Gerson Valley, he surrendered, he was captured, and he was uh, taken off to uh, Pentonville Prison, uh, where he would be hanged six weeks later. His ashes, however, were brought back to um, India in 1976. So they are now in India, but uh, he was hanged there. One of his acolytes, uh, also a follower of Savarkar, attempted to rescue him using the Irish um, uh, revolutionaries, who, by the way, the Indians and the Irish, you have to remember, were both fighting the British and they had close contacts, uh, a matter that is also not recognized very often. And the gentleman at the bottom is VVS Iyer. He was uh, another person. And, but this matter didn't happen. And then, in the middle of all of that, um, Savarkar escaped to Paris. Now, you have to remember that while he was operating out of London, he had also created networks all over the world with in Indian students studying in other parts of, of, of the continent and even in North America. And one of the places where there was a sizable group of Indian revolutionaries, uh, Shamji uh, Verma was himself there, and uh, there were others like Bhikaji Kama, who were based out of Paris. And they lived in these houses. I have just gotten there. I visited them. Bhikaji Kama lived in uh, 25 Rue de Pontilieu. Uh, the original house is not there, but this is the location. But I found another one uh, uh, where um, uh, on Rui Blanche, where Sardar, Rana, uh, Sardar Singh Rana used to live, and that building is still there. And I visited them a few months ago. And But when Savarkar went there, it would have been probably sensible for him to continue to stay there. But he felt very guilty because he had left behind, and once you already had Madan Lal Dhingra hanged, but the rest of his followers were still there. He felt that he was being a coward by continuing to hide in Paris. 
So, and very ill-advisedly, he escaped back to, uh, he, he went back to Paris, which turned out to be a bad decision, because, uh, so he went back to London, and it turned out to be a very bad decision because the British immediately captured him in the railway station, and of course he was charged with uh, uh, being a traitor against the King Emperor. And uh, he was put on a ship back to India, where he, would be, he was to be tried. But as the ship made its way through Marseille, uh, he had already sent a message to VVS uh, Iyer to go and contact Bhikaji Kama. And the idea was that he was going to escape from the ship in Marseille port. And the, 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 the uh, Bhikaji Kama and Iyer would turn up in a car and pick him up and they would escape. So on the appointed day, Savarkar indeed did jump off the ship in Marseille. And he swam to the port. Unfortunately, in those days you did not have any cell phones, etc. to coordinate. Bhikaji Kama and Ayer turned up just a little bit late. And so he was captured by the French and handed back to the British, back to the ship. So that is why Savarkar ended up back on the ship and he was brought to India and ultimately he too ended up in uh, Kalapani or the cellular jail. Now, although uh, <clears throat> Sri Aurobindo had now escaped to uh, French territory in Pondicherry and Savarkar was now uh, and Baringhosh were both in uh, Kalapani, the fire had already been lit and this was now taken up by <clears throat> a dynamic uh, leader called Raj Bihari Bose. And Raj Bihari Bose in 1912 uh, decided to try and assassinate um, Lord Hardinge, who was then the Viceroy, uh, in uh, Chandni Chok. And he and his young Lieutenant uh, Sachindranath Sanyal and a team that they had assembled in Delhi, in 1912, they threw a bomb in Chandni Chok from a place called Katra Dhulia. It's a wholesale market. It still exists. If you look at the left, it's a photograph of the area. And on the right, you have Raj Bihari Bose. They threw the bomb. It landed actually on Lord Hardinge. Uh, and it killed his mahout. And it very grievously hurt Lord Hardinge. He was very badly hurt, but he survived. Um, meanwhile, Raj Bihari Bose escaped back to Dehradun, where he worked. And Sachindranath Sanyal went back to uh, Varanasi. But his, the team in, in Delhi was captured. And they would be, of course, hanged. But Raj Bihari Bose then went back to Dehradun, where he worked in the Forestry Research Institute. And there, um, the place he used to work in, by the way, uh, is not the Grand Forestry Institute that you today see if you go to Dehradun. Uh, that in, uh, was still being constructed at that time. But it was this building that is still with the Forestry Institute, but is largely abandoned, the one on the left, the red one, and also the building on the right. This is where Raj Bihari Bose used to work as a research assistant in the Forestry Institute. But having gone back to Dehradun, he then organized a small event to condemn the attack on Lord Hardinge. And a few months later, when Lord Hardinge visited Dehradun, he was the leader of the welcoming committee. And when he welcomed Lord Hardinge, he of course asked him how he was feeling. Meanwhile, what was happening, another one of Savarkar's uh, followers, Lala Hardayal, had made his way to the US, to the West Coast. Now, the West Coast of North America, both the Canadian and the American sides, had by this time a sizable Indian community. A lot of them were Punjabis and Punjabi Sikhs. And Lala Hardayal began to connect with them and began to set in motion a movement that would become to known as the Gadar movement. And the Gadar movement, which was ultimately it created a headquarters of San Francisco, you can see that, the headquarters of the Hindustan Gadar party. That building still, by the way, exists. And in Berkeley, there were a lot of students who were organized under, under this. And they began to uh, think about and talk about and write about why India needs freedom. And they began to connect back to 
Raj Bihari Bose and Sachinath Sarial back in India. So they began to coordinate. Now remember, in the middle of all of this, what is happening? The First World War started. So the First World War started, and Raj Bihari Bose and Sachin Sarial said, "This is the first true opportunity we have to set in motion a revolt in the Indian Army." So they began to go out to all the uh, cantonments in northern India, particularly in Punjab and UP. and began to uh, to plan for a revolt in february of 2015 so they had got it all planned and they were going to have this great revolt in 2015 and uh, many gadarites who were based in the us also began to come back in the particularly sikhs that they would take part in this great revolt so it was all ready the revolt was going to take place the date was set but just a few days 3 4 days before the revolt was supposed to happen one of the minor members of the of this uh, plan switched sides and informed the british and overnight all the armories had the indian guards removed and replaced by european guards so as a result of which at the very last minute this revolt did not happen the only place where this revolt took place was in singapore where the local indian regiment revolted and held singapore for a full week in this is in february 2015 again a forgotten uh, episode in indian history now this did not end there the germans now realized that they, maybe they can take advantage of the uh, the this sentiment that was there in india and they began to connect through to them so what happened is the germans set up a full fledged operation in berlin with full diplomatic Uh, uh, uh support in berlin for the revolutionaries and what they did was they planned to put together a large amount of guns in fact remember the us had not yet part joined this uh, war so what has happened they bought 30000 rifles and they put it on a ship and they were going to sail it through the pacific they sailed it through the pacific and they were going to land it in near balasore on the odisha coast and what they would do is that there they had a contact gentleman called bagha jyotin you may have heard this name also and bagha jyotin had already planned and and trained thousands of young indians from that anishinan group or the jugantor group to basically how to use guns and as soon as these 30000 rifles were going to land they were going to be distributed and the idea was that on christmas day 2015 they would surround uh, kolkata particularly the governor's house in kolkata and take it over because remember on christmas day oh, Or, Kolkata was still the capital of India, and they would all have all the major officials around the empire would come to the governor's house, and they would capture them. That was the idea. Unfortunately, again, what happened is that the British got wind of this idea. The ship was intercepted and never came to Balasore. Bagha Jyotin landed up on Balasore coast, waiting for the ship, and he was also hunted down and killed there. now you may think that these are completely outrageous plans and they were never going to succeed that is not true because just at the same time that this was being done by the germans and supporting this kind of revolt in india the germans were also supporting lenin who the germans picked up from switzerland took by train through through finland and sweden to to st petersburg to lead the bolshevik revolution so the bolshevik revolution was also a part of exactly the same sort of plan it worked with the bolsheviks it did not work with the indians and by the way the british also used to do something very similar some of you may have heard of lawrence of arabia maybe watch the movie so a very similar plan was tried out by the british to get the arabs to revolt against the ottomans and that worked so these kinds of plans have worked did work even in the same war so i don't think they were outrageous plans it was just bad luck it didn't work but the reason i'm telling you this story is to just so that you get a sense of the grand scale of some of these uh, projects they were not done by small numbers of people there were large international and national connections uh, they they had support of foreign governments and links with foreign movements now when all these efforts failed many of those were captured 
Raj Bihari Bose, however, managed to escape to Berlin, where he would spend uh, much of the rest of the 25 years. And he will reappear in the story a little later, so wait for him. But he would marry a local lady, and he would make a living, by the way, through um, uh, uh, running a restaurant where he served uh, Indian curry. So if you ever visit Tokyo, do visit his restaurant that still exists. The old building, of course, was destroyed in the bombing of the Second World War. But the old restaurant still exists, and it still serves Raj Bihari Bose's original um, chicken curry. So I went there uh, about a year and a half ago and ate it, and it's pretty good. Um, meanwhile, Sachindranath Sanyal and many of these others, and you already know Savarkar, etc., were sent to Kalapani. Now, this is the cellular jail. These are, these are the corridors of the cellular jail. And this is where many of these uh, inmates were kept in very draconian conditions. Um, this is basically uh, the equi Indian equivalent of Auschwitz. And uh, if you visit it today, you will see one of the cells where Savarkar was kept is still there. And, the, and the, the revolutionaries were kept, they were treated extremely brutally. One of the punishments they used to be do, do is that they used to be forced to run a oil grinder all day. This is the, a picture of the oil grinder. They would put oil in there and turn it. And they would keep turning it and they, would, they were not allowed to stop. So supposing out of sheer exhaustion they collapsed and fell apart, they would be tied to it and their other prisoners would be made to turn it around. But the worst treatment was, that was subjected was to Savarkar himself. He was, in fact, sometimes tied to the wall of his cell for weeks on end and not allowed to lie down or sit down. Stand in his own excreta for weeks on end. And, of course, they tried to break him, but he didn't. So, if you do visit uh, uh, Andamans, do visit uh, one of the cells in which he stayed is still there. And you can see that many of the people, this is another picture of the cells uh, of the Andamans. And on the right, you have lists of the political uh, prisoners who were kept there. Now, of course, the First World War came to an end. And many of these people began, to, many of the soldiers of, who had fought for the British in Europe and in the Middle East began to come back. And they began to now come back to Punjab particularly, but many other parts of the country as well. And the British were now very, very concerned that you had these trained veterans who they knew that just a few years ago had planned to revolt. And they were very, very scared that you were going to get a grand revolution because the Gadarites were still there, the revolutionaries were still there, and they were already in infiltrating these groups. And remember now, these are hardened war veterans. So if they revolt, you'll really have a problem. So the British began to introduce very draconian rules called the Rowlett Acts. And it was a result of the protest against the Rowlett Acts that you had the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Again, very important to remember this because you hear about the Rowlett Acts, you hear about Jallianwala Bagh massacre, but very often you're simply not told about the link of the, the, the revolutionaries to what happened in Jallianwala Bagh. Now, after the, what happened in Jallianwala Bagh, of course, O'Dwyer and General Dyer were sent back. The governor, O'Dwyer, and, 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 and the person who had ordered the firing, uh, Dyer, were sent back. But the revolutionaries did not forget. Twenty years later, another revolutionary called Udham Singh would go to London in 1940 and hunt down O'Dwyer, who had been the governor at that time and had been the person who had supported Dyer's actions in Jallianwala Bagh. And he hunted them down to number 10 Caxton Hall in London and shot him dead. I visited Caxton Hall uh, about a year and a half ago, as you can see me standing in front of it. Um, I stood there and I sang the full version of the Vande Mataram in his memory on the steps of Caxton Hall. Madan Lal Dhingra, uh, sorry, just like Madan Lal Dhingra, who was uh, Udham Singh's uh, idol, uh, 
Udham Singh was also immediately captured. He was sent to the same uh, prison as Dhingra. He was hanged at the same gallows as Dhingra. And his ashes too were brought back in 1973. If you go to Jallianwala Bagh, you will see the kalash with his ashes, which are still there. And I've given a photograph of Udham Singh's ashes lying over there. Now, meanwhile, as a result of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, there were a huge amount of outrage across India. And this is when uh, Mahatma Gandhi began to organize the non-cooperation movement. There was there were many, a lot, large-scale loan cooperation with the British, and things looked quite dire for them at that time. So in order to uh, sort of appease the sentiments, the British allowed a large number of revolutionaries to be freed from Kalapani, and many of them came back to India. This included Sachinath Sanyal, Barin Ghosh, and others. It didn't include Savarkar, by the way, who was still considered way too dangerous. Now, some of those revolutionaries who came back joined the uh, non-cooperation movement, uh, which, <coughs> which was, of course, a, uh, not a uh, violent, but a non-violent movement. But some of them, like Sachinath Sanyal, remained quite suspicious of this whole thing, and they stayed away. Now, the movement began to gather pace. But then, as you know about the events in Chaudi Chora, it was very suddenly suspended. Now, some of the revolutionaries who had been all along very sus suspicious of uh, the nonviolent movement then felt justified in their suspicion and they began to again organize the revolutionaries into a new group and Sachindranath Sanyal under this uh, uh, point he was operating out of Varanasi where he came from he was Bengali but he came from Varanasi and he began to organize a new group under the heading of the Hindustan Republican Association and under it, the Hindustan Republican Army. The name Hindustan Republican Army is not by choice. It is directly named after the Irish Republican Army. So you have to remember that these are not people functioning in a vacuum. They are people who are functioning as people of their times. And he began to then recruit new people. So many of his recruits include Ram Prasad Bismil, Chandrasekhar Azad, Bhagat Singh, and others. But they had a problem in that they didn't have guns. Remember, all those German gun shipments had not actually managed to reach India. So what do they do? They had to buy guns. Particularly, they had a particular favorite gun, which was a Mauser. So they began to import these guns, but they had to pay for them. So how do you pay for these guns? So they decided to rob a train in a place called Kakodi, very, very close to Lucknow. Now, not everybody thought it was a good idea because one of the members, Ashfakullah, was of the opinion that it was a bad idea to attract too much attention. But he was overruled by Bismil and they decided to rob this train nonetheless. And they were successful in robbing the train. But it, as Ashfakullah had said, it attracted a lot of attention and immediately British intelligence was on the tail of the revolutionary movement. Many of them over the subsequent year or two were hunted down and this led to the famous Kakodi case and many people were caught including Sachindranath Sanyal who was again arrested along with his brother uh, and one of his uh, relatives uh, Rajendra Lahiri. Um, Rajendra Lahiri the gentleman above and Bismil below and Ashwakullah who was also captured a little later all three of them were hanged for this case. I particularly feel sorry for Ashwakullah because he was hanged for something that he had clearly warned against. But nevertheless, this again disrupted the Hindustan Republican Army. And now what happened is with the top leadership either hanged or in jail, a completely new leadership came about. Um, and this involved a very, very young leader called Chandrasekhar Azad and with him another young man, Bhagat Singh. And they began to operate and create networks. Now you have to remember many of the people I'm talking about are in the very, very young. They are your age. They're in their teens or twenties. And these were going out making networks in there. In the middle of all of this, what happens is that Lala Lajpat Rai, remember one of the trio Lal Bal Pal, 
So Lala Lajpat Rai, who had been one of the friar brand leaders, he was leading a march that was lati charged and the British officials basically beat him to death. And Bhagat Singh decided that he was going to try and avenge this. And so they hunted down the officials who had carried them out and one of the officials, Saunders, was shot dead by Bhagat Singh and his group. He then escaped from Lahore to Kolkata and then back to Delhi, where yeah. he famously decided to throw a bomb in the Legislative Assembly, which is now the Indian Parliament. Before he went, did this, he had a one last picnic in a park called Kutsia Park. It still exists, you can go and see it, although I'm not clear exactly where he did the picnic, he and his group. So he went there along with Batukeshwar Dutt for a, one last picnic. They knew they would be captured, they knew they would probably never come out alive. And then they were captured, and then many of their acolytes, <laughs> like Sukhdev Thapar, Shivram Guru, etc., would be captured. And the three of them would then be hanged in Lahore. And their bodies would then be taken and cremated in Husseiniwala in 1931. Now, when India became independent and was partitioned in 1931, Husseiniwala ended up on the other side of the border. But it tells you the kind of sentiment that these young men carried that India, after partition in 1961, agreed to exchange 12 villages with Pakistan in order to get Husseiniwala back into Indian territory. So today, Husseiniwala is in Indian territory and you can, there's a memorial to them. Uh, if you visit Husseiniwala, please do visit it. Now, meanwhile, what was happening is that Chandrasekhar Azad was still at large and he was now basically the only leader that was around. He was also a very young man. But he was now beginning to organize various groups and the British were looking for him. But they actually didn't know what he looked like. Somehow he had ma managed to keep his identity totally under wraps. And he managed to operate several times. In fact, he even made an attempt to rescue Bhagat Singh from Lahore jail, which didn't quite work out. Nonetheless, <coughs> he was uh, found in uh, Alfred Park in Allahabad in 1931. And he was ca uh, cornered um, and shot uh, uh, dead. He wasn't shot dead, rather. He was cornered and he kept fighting till he had only one bullet left. And because he had said that he would never be captured alive, he used the last bullet to shoot himself dead. That is his dead body after he had killed himself. Now, the question is, how did people know who and where, uh, uh, how did people, uh, 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 how did the British find uh, Chandrasekhar Azad. There were only uh, two or three people who knew Chandrasekhar Azad was in Allahabad. Uh, one was Jawaharlal Nehru, who he had met the previous day. The other was uh, the Sanyal family, who lived in Colonel Ganj, which is right next to uh, those who we are familiar with uh, Allahabad will know. Right outside Alfred Park is Colonel Ganj. Uh, the Sanyal family was living there, although Sachin Sanyal was in jail, the rest of his family was there. So they knew. Uh, but we have later on found out uh, in, um, uh, uh, who was the source of the information that led to him being hunted down. And it turns out that the source of information was a person who later became a famous Hindi writer called Yashpal. Uh, Yashpal, after independence, would present himself as a great revolutionary and writer and he would become one of the great and famous writers after independence. I think he even got the Padma Bhushan and various awards and so on. Um, the, sadly, uh, we discovered also in the 1960s a CID official um, <clears throat> uh, would, uh, called Dharmendra Gaur would find in the files of CID in Lucknow a letter uh, written by uh, a British official in the very last few months of uh, British rule as they were evacuating India a letter written by one of the officials to another person, basically handing over an, a collaborator or an informer. And this letter clearly describes uh, Yashpal and says, Yashpal provided us with the information. Now, this is very, very interesting because Yashpal was the other person who knew that Chandrasekhar Azad was in Allahabad at that point in time. And all along, the revolutionaries were suspicious of Yashpal. And in fact, I know this, that many of the revolutionaries were in fact later be hunting for Yashpal because of which the British would fake an encounter, capture him and keep him in Naini jail. The reason he was in Naini jail was not because 
the British were trying to punish him, but because they were trying to protect him from other revolutionaries. Otherwise, no self-respecting revolutionary was ever sent to Naini Jail. Now, while all of this was happening through the 30s, another thing began to happen. You began to see a new war began to pop up. And the old revolutionaries again said that this was going to be yet another opportunity to try and foment a revolt in the Indian Army. Because the British would have no choice but to recruit large numbers of Indians to fight in the Second World War. Now this is the time in which Netaji Subhash Bose had, who had been elected the president, legitimately elected the president of the Indian National Congress, but had then been squeezed out by the Gandhian faction uh, and had been forced consequently to resign. Netaji began to drift away and he was contacted by the revolutionaries and they began to come up with a plan about doing something. Now this is very, very important that you understand this sequence of events because very often who, people who do not know the history of the revolutionaries and their links to the Japanese through Raj Bihari Bose and to the Germans through the very first world war, they very often accuse Netaji of suddenly developing a love for fascism or Japanese imperialism. That is totally not the case. His links through to these two countries in the Second World War were very much driven by the history of these two countries to the revolutionaries from a much earlier time. So it was not very, very surprising that in the uh, run-up to the Second World War, Netaji would meet both the German, but more importantly, the Japanese consuls in India. And I have it from first-hand accounts that Sachinrath Sanyal and uh, the Japanese consul would repeatedly meet Netaji in the, in the few weeks before he escaped from Kolkata and made his way to Germany through uh, Soviet Union. In fact, just the day or two before he escaped from Kolkata and house, uh, his house arrest, he actually met Savarkar. And this is also quite interesting here because you can clearly see the same people keep coming back into the story. And then he escaped to Germany where he tried to elicit help from Hitler, which he didn't get very much of. But meanwhile, what was happening, the Japanese managed to take over Singapore. And there, they managed to capture very large numbers of Indian troops who had surrendered. And so the Japanese got hold of Raj Bihari Bose. Remember the guy who had escaped from the First World War, during the First World War to Japan? They got hold of him and he told him to try and organize this into the Indian National Army. You have to remember, it was Raj Bihari Bose who set up the Indian National Army, not Netaji. Unfortunately, by this point, he was a very old man. And so he very quickly realized that he would not be able to handle this. And it is at this point that Netaji was invited from Germany to come to Singapore and basically took control of the provisional government of Free India as well as the Indian National Army. Now the Indian National Army would then fight along with the British in Burma. And of course, as all of you know, the war would be brought by the British troops. So the Indian National Army would then fall apart and then would uh, have to retreat. There is, however, uh, still many of the places associated with the Indian National Army in Singapore are still there. The building you see at the back, the town hall, where Netaji spoke to the British troops is still there. Uh, the field, the Padang, where he spoke to the British field, you can see them there, that is still there. It's right in front of the Singapore Cricket Club. You can go and see it. It more or less looks the same even today. There is a small memorial to the INA, which is also still uh, there. So please go and visit these places. Uh, of course, the, yet again, the, in military terms at least, the Indian National Army's effort had yet again failed. So in that sense, the revolutionaries had yet again failed to instigate a revolt in the Indian Army that would throw, overthrow British rule. But that is not the end of the story. What would happen is that the soldiers and troops of the Indian National Army were brought back to India and they were tried in the Red Fort. 
If you go to the Red Fort, there is a bauli there, which is still there, where many of the officers were held uh, during their trial. And you can see me standing right in front of some of them, which of course included famously Colonel Shah Nawaz Khan, Gurbak Singh Dillo, and Prem Kumar Segal, but many of the others as well. Now, it turned out to be a major tactical error made by the British, because what happened is that there was an absolute sensation. Because you see, during the Second World War, most Indians were unaware of what really was happening with the INA because of censorship. But once wartime censorship was removed and all these troops were brought back, suddenly the story of the INA came to public notice. And there was absolute sensation. And the story began to spread about what the INA had done, the resistance they had put up, and all the interesting and heroic stories of the INA began to percolate, not just the general population, but also the armed forces. And ultimately, this culminated in the naval revolt of 1946. This is a very, very major event in Indian history. Again, the history of the Royal Indian Navy's revolt of 1946 is very rarely told to you, but it was a very major event. Something like 18 to 20,000 veterans of the Second World War, sailors, went on strike. They took over something like 80 ships in Mumbai Harbor. Remember, these are trained veterans. They know how to use those guns. They took over the signals networks. When the British officials asked the Royal Indian Air Force pilots to take action against them, the, the, the pilots refused. Um, there were simultaneous revolts began in Karachi and in Kolkata. Large numbers of populace came onto the streets in support of the sailors. Uh, there were also reports of how uh, many arm, uh, army regiments were about to go into revolt if asked to fight against their uh, 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 colleagues in the Navy. This was the point, ladies and gentlemen, where the British finally realized that they could not control India. In many, many ways, this is the point when India became free. This is a very different story, as you can see, of how India became free. It is a story of resistance, of persistence, and ultimately of a strategy that was tried repeatedly. The first attempt, perhaps, happened in 1857, but there was a continuity in that story, with an attempt made in the First World War with the Gadarites, a second attempt made with the INA, and finally succeeding with the Naval Revolt culminating just a year later with Indian independence. It is not a uh, coincidence that it was during the naval revolt that Attlee announced the cabinet commission for India's independence. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very, very, very different story. And I thought this story too should be told. Thank you very much. Now, I'm happy to answer some Q&A if, if time permits. Um, Good afternoon, sir. Where? Ah, here. My own view is absolutely not. There is no particular reason why the Indian revolutionaries would necessarily have ended up with a fascist outcome. The Indian revolutionaries had fairly sophisticated ideas about uh, the way the world was. Uh, many of them were very well read, by the way, Raj Bihari Bose and Sri Aurobindo and so on. There's absolutely no reason to do that. This is a propaganda that is floated, uh, very often justified on the grounds that Netaji had in the Second World War started, uh, sided with um, 
the access powers. But this is purely a way of trying to negate their contributions to the story. Um, the, the Hindustan Republican Association, for example, clearly wanted a democratic India. They were very, very clear about it. Um, many of them had uh, Bhagat Singh and so on, of course, came from a more socialist pers persuasion. So they accepted, while they had a broad ideology in terms of armed resistance against British rule, there was a plurality in terms of from Hindu nationalism to socialism to many other worldviews. And they worked together with each other. I think it is very, very unfair and in fact deliberate subversion of the story uh, in order to try and suppress this alternative history of India's independence. After all, many of the others who fought for independence at the same time, who were their acolytes, did not lead to fascism. Um, did, for example, the Irish, who had very similar ideas, um, the Irish Republic was a democratic republic. Uh, many other places had uh, you know, armed revolt led to freedom. Uh, they didn't become fascist. Um, so there is no particular reason why India should have gone down that path. Of course, it is impossible to tell what would have happened. Um, because at independence, unfortunately, most of the senior leaders of the uh, revolutionaries had been killed or had died. Uh, Raj Bihari Bose had died during the Second World War. Uh, Sachin Nath Saniyal had died during the Second World War. Um, of course, all the others, Bismil, uh, Bhagat Singh, uh, Chandrasekhar Azad had been killed. Uh, only two people actually of the revolutionary movement's senior leaders actually survived till independence. Interestingly, both of them were the original founders of the movement, Sri Aurobindo and Savarkar. And both of them by this point in time had drifted away from the movement in their own ways. So they, at independence what happened 